Hey there, Pastor Mark here. It's our prayer that this message would encourage and equip you in your relationship with Jesus. We're able to provide this content due to the joyful generosity of our financial partners. And if you'd be willing to join that tribe and help get some sermons like this around the world, you can donate at harvestbaptist.info slash give. God bless. Well, we're going to keep working through this sermon series called Practicing the Practices. And the idea behind the series is that all of us as Christians, we are called to follow Jesus. We are called to be a disciple of Jesus. We are called to apprentice under Jesus, right? And there is from a macro level, this, the way that this works, there's a system or a process for this. So there is how you start discipleship. That's by faith in the Lord Jesus. You have to understand that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and that you can't come to the Father except through him. You have to say, Jesus, you're my Lord, you are my Savior, I'm putting my trust exclusively in you. But once you have done that and begun the process, then there's this path of discipleship, and you want to be with Jesus and be like Jesus. You want to commune with him. You also want to model your life after him and become more and more like him. And eventually that will lead you to kind of the goal of discipleship, which is to join in the mission of Jesus and to say, what was he doing? Well, that's what I want to do. What was he on about? That's what I want to be on about. And the two big pillars that support being with Jesus and being like Jesus and even joining in the mission of Jesus, the two big pillars of support are taking in his words and his ways, absorbing his truth and wanting to know how life really works and, and listen to him and, and model your life after that, but also wanting to say, what did you do? What did you tell us to do? And this is where we get to the practicing the practices. And we have worked through a number of these. We have today, and then we have two more after this. And this morning, we are going to discover the practice of hospitality. This is one that if I asked you to list for me your top 10 list of what were the things that Jesus said we should do, that Jesus practiced in his life that, that we should do, you would put down probably prayer, maybe fasting would have made your list, you know, scripture, worship, those sorts of things. But most people wouldn't put hospitality on their top 10 list. I have it on ours as a church. We're doing nine of these through the last couple months and this month. And I have it on our top nine list. Because, A, I think it's very essential to reaching the lost, and I think you see that in the life of Jesus, but B, I feel like out of all the practices that we're discovering or talking about or maybe relearning, that this is the one that comes up over and over and over again in conversation with you all that is already happening with almost zero teaching or training or effort from the pulpit or corporately for us to have any sort of program or encouraging. It's just happening organically. And it's one that I really believe stands a chance to go from good to great over the next 12 months or so in the life of our church. And I hope that it does. We already do a lot of this. And I hear from people often, hey, I invited them, you know, I met them at church and I want to get to know them. I want to feel welcome. So I invited them over to my house or we had small group at my house and, and we hosted or I got coffee with them. I get that all the time. And I think that we could even do better. And I'm excited to discover this idea of hospitality. So we're going to hang our thoughts on four particular words. And those four words are pattern, parts, purpose, practicality. So what is the pattern of hospitality? What, is, what are the parts of hospitality? What's the purpose? And then ultimately, how do we make this practical? So let's start with the pattern. Whether you realize it or not, if you are a Christian, you are part of the richest hospitality tradition in the history of the world. You say, no, 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 the richest hospitality tradition is like the Ritz Carlton or uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines and their like fleet of, of companies that they have or something. Those are the richest traditions. No, 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 Christianity is. If you, if you are part of Christianity, right, your spiritual tree, so to speak, has its roots in hospitality, whether you know it or not. There is, if you look back at ancient cultures, there is this 
almost necessity for hospitality to be a part of the way of their life. Uh, Tim Keller does a great job articulating this in a sermon on hospitality from Hebrews 13 that I listened to like three or four years ago. And ever since that sermon, I've wanted to actually preach on this topic and it's just, it hasn't been fitting until today. But he articulates in grave order what, what it was like in ancient days. And kind of the cliff note version of that is it was just very different than today. If you travel somewhere, you are going to lodge at either like your family or friend's house or a hotel. Like that, that's pretty much where you're going to stay. If you have a camper, maybe you're going to go camping or something, but you're not going to go to a stranger's house and spend the night. It's not going to happen. If you travel today, you're going to whatever, go across 80, going out west or something, and you're going to find gas stations along the way, fast food along the way. You're going to stop and get food. Not the case in the ancient world. Travel was something that was done so infrequently, but it was so different. It was dangerous, first of all. And you see this in the Bible. Proverbs talks about that your poverty will come as one that travels because it was very dangerous. You would see this in the case of the Good Samaritan, the story that Jesus told of this guy traveling and he's robbed and mugged and put on the side of the road and then someone eventually comes along and helps them. But it was very dangerous to do. You also just didn't have all of these amenities. There may have been in some towns like NN somewhere, I-N-N and N, right? Like in the Christmas story, but it was very irregular. So you relied on people's hospitality. And the way that this worked was that you were going to travel and if you needed food or you needed a, some sort of shelter, which you did, you were going to stop maybe at the city well or at the city gate and you were hoping that someone would be hospitable to you. And it operated on an invite, then sort of kind of a vetting process, then there would be some provision, then you would depart. So you would be invited to come. You could see this happen actually in the case of Paul in Acts 16, if you want to read that story in your own time, where he is by the river in Philippi, he's at a new place, and he's dependent upon a Lydia, a seller of purple, coming and inviting Paul and his entourage into the house to stay with him. He needed that. You would find this in Genesis where Abraham sends out his servant to go get Isaac's wife. And as he travels, what is he doing? He's by the well and eventually he's invited and he gets water and come back to my house. We have straw, we have food, we have lodging for you. But you needed that. And when you were invited, there was a vetting process. People were okay with hosting strangers. You say, what do you mean strangers? Like strangers. Like, I don't know you. Who are you? Never met you before. What's your name? But you had to make sure the stranger wasn't an enemy. So oftentimes you would ask them questions. You would try to do a little bit of like soft interrogation. Often when you traveled, you'd have a letter of recommendation potentially from someone that was noteworthy, or perhaps you were going to a region and you knew your family had connections there. So you'd have a letter from that person. Or if you were in the early church, maybe you'd have a letter from your pastor so that when you went to a town, you could try to find a Christian or a church and then they would host you. So they vetted you and then they would provide for you. You'd be able to stay there and lodge. You were expected as the host to give them food and meal. You were expected to give them rest because it was very taxing to travel. And then eventually you would depart. And the rule of thumb was two days. You could stay for two nights, but after two nights, don't take advantage of people. You had to get out of there. And there was this system of hospitality across the ancient world that was necessary for them to commute, unless you were some potentate that had like a hundred camels and a big tent, you know, on a cart and all these baskets of food that you carried with you. The average Joe just couldn't do that. You needed hospitality. Now here's where it gets interesting. God on multiple occasions takes this idea of hospitality in the ancient world, and he ratchets it up. And he says, I need you to do more. And he tells his people that. So he does it with the Jewish people. When he makes a covenant with the Jewish people in Mount Sinai, he tells them that they are to be like unreasonably hospitable. And here's his, his line of argumentation. If you want to read it with me, it's in your notes. Deuteronomy chapter number uh, 10 God executes the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, and God loves the stranger. So notice this. God has a heart for the down and outer. God has a heart for those that are on the margins of society. The widow, the orphan, and notice the stranger. We would say perhaps the immigrant. God has a heart for them, giving him food and raiment. So you, my people, model this. Love ye therefore the stranger. And then listen to this line. It's, it's classic. It's classic. 
you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Remember when there was a famine and you were about to be toast? But there was Joseph who had gone to Egypt and there was a Pharaoh who gave you land and provided for you and saved you so that you could keep going and keep existing. Remember the hospitality you received from them. And of course, we know that hospitality eventually went sour, but remember that. And then remember, he says, the the food, the clothing, remember in the wilderness now as we're going I'm providing you a cloud by day to keep you shaded. I'm providing you a pillar of fire by night to keep you warm. I'm providing you with manna from heaven. I'm providing you with water from the rock. I'm the one that's making sure your your clothes don't wear out. I am being hospitable to you. So however it is in the ancient culture, take it up a notch. Go be hospitable. Fast forward a long time to the time of Jesus. You get to the time of Jesus and now there is this culture that is pronounced in, in Judaism of hospitality, but they've taken a couple steps back. And now they are hospitable to a point. You want me to care for an orphan, those that were in Judaism? Sure. But you want me to care for the Samaritan? Nope. You want me to care for a widow? Cool. You want me to care for a tax collector or a publican? Not a chance. And they're all of a sudden, in Jesus' day, there were these lines of demarcation that we don't host those people. We don't eat with those people. We don't help those people, right? We are not hospitable to them at all. And here comes Jesus onto the scene, as he normally does, shattering all categories and saying like, well, watch me. And what does he do? He opens his arms and he, and he shares the gospel with the Samaritans, right? And is there with them. Not only was he there at the well, but then this whole episode follows after that. Here is Jesus eating with publicans, eating with prostitutes, eating with all of these people that were socially taboo to eat with. There's this, this line of argumentation that I think is so valid from the Bible that Tim Chester really presses home in his little book, A Meal with Jesus. It's very short, six chapters. If you want to read more on this, I would recommend this book. It, it's fantastic. But Chester poses the question, how did Jesus come? And we get the answer from the Bible. If you want to say, well, Jesus came preaching the gospel. Jesus came healing the sick. Jesus came this or that. Yes, but the Bible tells us, and Jesus' own self-testimony, is that Jesus came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. And Chester says, these actually are statements of purpose. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, serve them, and to give his life as a ransom for them. He was like a heat-seeking missile looking for people that did not know God or were far from God so that he could bring them back and he could find the lost and bring them back in. That's why he came. But there's one other time where Jesus says the Son of Man came. And Chester says this is not the why, this is the what. The Son of Man came, here it is in, let me find it, Luke 7. Let me back up a step. John the Baptist came not eating or drinking. He didn't eat bread nor drink wine. And you said, he has a devil. But the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. And he's saying, I can't please you people. No matter what we do, you're constantly at us. But it's extremely notable that Jesus said, I came, not like John, I came eating and drinking. And Chester says, this is not the why, this is the how. This is a statement of methodology that I am come to find those that are far from God and to serve them and to to draw them back to God, to give my life a ransom for them. How am I going to do this? Well, Jesus came with a dinner bell. Jesus came wanting to sit at tables with people. And notice who, who he says, I sat at the tables with, right? You've said, here he comes. He's a glutton. He's a wine bibber. He's, he's eating too much, drinking too much. He's, he's do- and you're saying that I'm a friend of the, of the publicans and the sinners. And it's tough for us to wrap our head around that because we're like, we don't have publicans. Oh, is that, what is that? Oh, a tax collector? I mean, we have tax collectors, but I mean, I don't know. I don't hate them. Like, they're just normal people. But in that day, to be a publican, to be a tax collector, it would be... 
as socially taboo as us, like there's, we have our own socially taboo categories. It would be like us saying the pedophile or the white supremacist or the terrorist, right? Those are like the top echelon of socially taboo people you may want to stay, stay clear of, right? Underneath that are the people from Philly or the Ravens fans. But <laughs> you keep going. I'm just kidding if you're from Philly. <clears throat> But seriously, it was like Jesus saying, like, I'm inviting a group of pedophiles and some terrorists over to my table to have a meal so that I can share the gospel with them, right? And this was unacceptable to them. They, they wouldn't have this. And Chester says this, perhaps we should take the Son of Man came and turn it into we should go. We should go seeking the lost. We should go serving, not being served. We should go eating and drinking. Perhaps there's a space to use, as Jesus did, the meal, the table, hospitality, as a way not only to develop community with others, but as a way to reach out to those who are lost. And that's a beautiful idea. And it's that idea actually that is ratcheted up even further. If you look at the New Testament in the local church, there was ancient culture, then there was Jewish culture, then there was Christian culture that took it even further because they understood the power of this. More to come on that if you think that I just made that up in a moment, but let's first consider the parts of hospitality. So the parts are pretty simple. You could add to this, like I, I wouldn't cut it off here and say this is a hard line, but the parts were pretty simple. You were trying to provide lodging for people and I was thinking this week as, as I've studied through this of people in our church who have gone above and beyond in that category. And I hate to, to name names, but I think of the Rashans who have opened their home so many times for people. Or Steve Garia who's opened his home and said like, hey, it's ours. I was thinking of the Gauls. Of course, the, the Gauls are now full-time missionaries in Macedonia and they've sold their place in Eterna Heights and, and we're here as a part of our church and on our deacon board for years. But for years, the Gauls were half the time medical missionaries in Gauls, Macedonia and half the time here, six months, six months. And every single time Tim Gall left the country, he gave to me or one of our pastors the keys to his house and said, if anyone needs a place to stay while well, I'm gone, it's theirs. No questions asked. You don't even have to email me and tell me. Just go let them use the place. What is that? That is using what I have to be hospitable to other people. And I think of, I'm looking around the room and seeing some and Fru and Edwards and others who stayed in their home because he was hospitable. So there was, there was lodging, there was food. There certainly is a place for food banks. There is, there's a place for food drives. There's a place to gift people with food who need food. Of course, this time of year with Thanksgiving and turkeys and baskets, it, it's kind of in full swing this time of year, which I love but to give food, but then to give meals. And food and meals are different. Food is, here's some food, go eat. You can give a, a bag of McDonald's to someone who's homeless on the side of the road. That's different than inviting them to your house for a meal. Meals are far more powerful. They represent community. They represent companionship. They represent friendship. They represent welcome. They're social occasions. I like the way that Carolyn Steele in her book, Hungry City, how food shapes our lives, said few acts are more expressive of companionship than a shared meal. Someone with whom we share food is likely to either be our friend or well on their way to becoming our friend. When I share a meal with you, this means we have a relationship or I want relationship. We are, I could talk about all these parts, but I'll center most of my conversation this morning on the idea of meals. I think that's the most accessible way for us as a Christian community to be hospitable to those that are around us that also know Jesus and are of the household of faith, but also to those who are outside and are lost and do not know God is, is meals. It's a powerful tool to use. You would also provide rest. You would wash their feet. You would give them a place to lay. You would make sure that they were comfortable. But those were the parts of hospitality. And here's the purpose. And when you read the Bible, it's hard to preach on the subject, honestly, because there's, there's so many like motivations or good purposes that come out of hospitality. But I think that there are five kind of clear reasons that you would do this or, or avenues that you would express this. So first is, why would I be hospitable? What's the purpose of it? Is don't ever lose sight of the abundant life. Jesus' words and Jesus' ways lead to the best life, period. 
End of sentence. When you do life as he did or told us to do, then what you are getting is the best life advice. Like he knows how to best be human. He is the wonderful counselor. And when you adopt his words and ways, it is good for you. It's very good for you. We know that Jesus said, I didn't come to steal. I didn't come to kill. I didn't come to take advantage of you, but I came to give you life and that you might have it more abundantly. But you need to understand how even a meal or hospitality is deeply connected to like joy or life abundant. Sometimes we get this idea that A, as Christians, we're supposed to be joyful, which is a true idea. And B, that somehow that's just magically going to happen. Like one day we're going to go to bed, we're going to pray, God just make me a joyful person. And when we wake up, it's like he just flipped a switch on, on our back or something. And now we're joyous. Like we're expecting God to fly over us with a, with a joy bomb and just drop it on our heads. And poof, you know, now we're joyous. It doesn't work that way. You have, to, you have to take in his words and his ways. And if you'll do that, joy follows. And you have far more control of this than you ever actually give credence to. Like you have a lot of control over what you think. So you can think about your boss who's miserable and has it out for you and, and just is the worst. And you'll probably have some anxiety and some anger and stuff because you're thinking about that a lot. Or you can think about, as the choir sang so beautifully, man, God's been good. Man, what, what blessings has he given to me? You always got drops of rain and rays of sunshine. Every day, you got both. And you can choose which ones to really ponder over, but one is joy producing, your actions. The action of sitting down at a meal with people and sharing in relationship with them is a joy producing action. All the social studies tell us this. We are, some argue, we are at our happiest when we are sitting at a table with people we know and love and are sharing a meal with them. Think about the precious memories that you would have or if you reflected back on what, what do I want to repeat? What brings nostalgia? What brings fondness? They're probably memories that are centered around a meal in some way, shape, or form, right? My wedding day. Well, what'd you do at your wedding day? You didn't have a ceremony and send everybody home. You sat down with the people that best know you and best know your spouse and you served them a meal, probably, not all of you did, but probably, and you ate together and communed together and you danced together and you had a good time. Would Christmas be Christmas without Christmas, whatever it is for you? Some of you, it's like Christmas Eve dinner. Some of you, it's Christmas breakfast. Some of you, it's Christmas brunch. Whatever your tradition is, would it be Christmas without that meal? You know the one I'm talking about. Would Thanksgiving be Thanksgiving without the Thanksgiving meal? I wouldn't recommend it. I, I would, we talked about fasting. I recommend fasting. I wouldn't recommend Thanksgiving Day. Like you don't get extra credit from God if you do it on Thanksgiving Day. Just have a feast on Thanksgiving Day. It's what it's for. And be grateful and celebrate. This is actually the discipline that if you read Richard Foster or Dallas Willard or many who have written about spiritual disciplines for decades, they don't actually call it hospitality. They call it celebration. The idea that we would celebrate in joyous occasion, but if you read their writings, they almost always tie it back to the meal and how that is such a centerpiece for us to experience joy in our lives. I was, I was just on the receiving end of this not too long ago, not to you know, brag on them too much or toot their own horns, but Dom and Rose invited all of the, the pastors and our wives over for dinner in October. And they said, we just want to host you guys and, and be hospitable. And so there was, you know, five couples, 10 of us total in the home. And then they had us over and it was like, it was, it was like Thanksgiving. I mean, it was the table, the, the candles, the, the bread, the olive oil, the pastas, the desserts, the whatever. And we sat at that table and we talked and we laughed. I think we may have shed a few tears. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. But we just had a great time. It was only a few hours. But man, it was life-giving. And you have to understand when there's this, when you put into practice the practice of hospitality, it is life-giving. You say, I hate the kitchen. It drains me. More to come on that. I, I know it can, but it's life-giving. Second is the Lord's Supper. 
So in the early church, communion or the Lord's table or the Lord's supper was a table and a supper. (laughs) You say, well, how did it become the world's smallest snack then? Um, (laughs) Maybe a whole sermon on that in 2024. We may get there eventually. I'd love to, because there is like, there's some process to get us to where we are today, but they had a meal If you come from a brethren tradition, you would have experienced this because most brethren churches still celebrate it as uh, the agape meal or the love meal, which is so fitting and so beautiful. But there was this idea of we're going to eat together when we remember the body and blood of Jesus. Like we're going to have a full meal like Jesus had a full meal with his disciples in the upper room. They didn't just have, you know, a, a, a little cracker. They ate a full meal. You could find this in in 1 Corinthians 11, and it's very clear. They're eating a lot. That People are getting drunk. Of course, they're they're condemned for that. That was wrong. But there was the Lord's Supper. The meal served a purpose there. There was also Christian fellowship. Not at the Lord's Supper necessarily, but just in general, the early Christian church was very good at dining together. You would find this in Acts, for example, that they continued in one accord and unity. They were in the temple and they were breaking bread from house to house and they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart and they praised God. Like they, they would get together corporately, but they'd also break up into homes and they would eat together, breaking bread, meat with gladness. And there was a joyous occasion around let us fellowship as the Christian community. But that's not really the heart of what I want to get at today. The heart of what I want to get at today is actually number four and number five. Hospitality as a means of loving our neighbors and hospitality as a means of reaching the lost. Because while Jesus did dine with his disciples, upper room before he's crucified, wedding feast, Cana of Galilee, more often than not when you see Jesus eating, it is as a way to reach people who are far from God. So we want to understand that hospitality is a tremendous gift to use to express love of neighbor. Hebrews 13 is, uh, is the passage that Keller used when he preached on, on hospitality that I mentioned earlier. And the, and the passage is, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, or some have entertained angels without knowing it. You say, can you say a word about that whole, you're hosting angels. No. Um, we will, though, we will tease, this is a tease, and Christmas, we will say more about that because our Christmas sermon series is angels. And we'll start that on December the 10th, I believe that it is. And, uh, and we'll look at, because angels are all over the Christmas story with Mary, with Joseph, with the shepherds, you know, all over the place. And we'll try to understand more of angels and who are they and what are they and what do they do and how they tie into the Christmas story. But We'll cover that phrase later. Give me a couple weeks. But before that phrase, let brotherly love, let Philadelphia continue, right? And don't forget to entertain strangers. Entertain strangers is one word. Uh, Philoxenia. It's the same root as Philadelphia. It's a play on words. Let the Philadelphia continue. Don't forget Philoxenia. Let the brotherly love continue. How? I'm going to show this love or express this love to the stranger, to the foreigner, to the people that I don't know. I'm going to express this love through hospitality and hosting them and saying, I have lodging for you. I have a meal for you. I have comfort for you. I have rest for you. Let that continue and express it in this way. Don't, do not let it die. Right? Be a conduit of this. Do not be this cul-de-sac that just takes in but never puts out. Express this and let it go, but then reach the lost. These are closely connected to each other, loving our neighbors and reaching the lost. They're very closely connected, but I think different. One commentator on Luke's gospel, Robert Karras, concluded that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, eating a meal, or coming from a meal. But you read the whole thing. It's just meals. You find in Luke chapter number five, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. Luke seven, Jesus is anointed at the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. Luke nine, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Luke 10, Jesus eats in the home of Mary and Martha. Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and teachers of the law at a meal. Luke 14, Jesus is at a meal when he urges people to invite the poor to their meals, not just their friends. 
Luke 19, Jesus invites himself to dinner with Zacchaeus. Luke 22, we have the account of the Last Supper. Luke 24, the risen Christ, what does he do? He finds two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he eats a meal with them. And then he finds his disciples, and he grills up some fish, and he eats some fish with them. But there's meals all over the place, and that's not even to mention the meals that are in other Gospels. This can be such a profound and useful methodology to establish a relationship with and share your life and the good news of Jesus with those that are around you, if you let it. One of the best books on this is the book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Anyone read The Gospel Comes with a House Key by Rosaria Butterfield? Can I see a sprinkling through here? But Rosaria just tells the story in her own words of how she was not a Christian. And a pastor and his wife opened their home and just invited her to eat with them regularly and to be there and how that how she saw the gospel through their lives and how it changed her life, eventually put her faith in Jesus. She's a pastor's wife now. She writes, she speaks, but it all started because someone was hospitable. That was the tool that was used to reach her. And that's so valid. That's so valid. Like the, the Zacchaeus story isn't the Zacchaeus story without a meal. I know that we, we sing it in, in junior church as just like, he got up in a tree, he was a wee little man, and then he came down. But the whole, I'm going to your house today, you know what I'm talking about? Like that part was to eat, right? Where Jesus is like, hey, I hear that you have this sweet crib because you oppress the poor. Let's go there and get in that pantry, buddy, and let's talk about that. We should change this, you know? And he sits down with him over a meal, and they talk. Now, I must say, please don't, if you're going to do this, and I think that you and we should, please do not do a bait and switch with people. If you invite your neighbor who doesn't know Jesus over for a meal and you say, I would like you to come to a meal and I would love to share with you all about Jesus and what he's done in my life, go for it. But if you invite them under the premise of, hey, we'd love to just get to know you guys, come over and hang out, please don't bait and switch them. Many of us know what it's like to be invited to a meal that was really a Cutco Knives presentation. You know what I'm talking about? Or, hey, I'm having a bunch of my girlfriends over to hang out. And lo and behold, it was a Tupperware party. And now you got to buy something before you leave. And we all hate those, don't we? If, you're, if you sell Tupperware, I'm sorry. I know it's the method, but we all hate them. <laughs> don't do that to people. Do not invite them over for a meal. They have no idea this has anything to do with Jesus. And then pull out your flannel graph and start telling them stories. Like, that, that won't go well. But do be genuine. Talk to them. Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to watch the Steelers game. We're going to do this. What are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're going to go to church. We, we go every week. We love it. You have, a, you have a church background? Like, you can have a normal conversation. Don't leave God off the table. Like, God should flow throughout the course of your normal conversation just as you talk to people. Hey, we don't know you well. What's your story? How'd you meet? They tell you. What's your story? That's probably what they're going to ask you. Well, tell them your story, but don't leave God out of the story. Tell them what God's done in your life as, as you talk through that. There are ways to do that in a very natural way. Don't be off-putting or weird about it. That's the point I'm trying to make because you can turn this into something that it's not supposed to be. But it being a way to connect with people and share the goodness of God with them is so unbelievably valid and such a purpose for why Christians could be hospitable. So what's the practicality of this? How do we take this and make it uh, come home. I have nine points, probably too many. You say, why not round up to 10? Because nine only came out of my brain. So I liked these nine though. How might you put this into practice in your life? And you can use your own ways. You don't have to take it from me, but here are ways. First of all, have family dinner. You say, I thought this was for a Christian community. And I thought this was for the lost. You didn't say anything about my kids. I know, but it's worth noting. Have family dinner. Like, be hospitable with your own family first. Maybe you want to host Thanksgiving or something, but I especially like family dinner as a, it doesn't have to be every night. I've never met a family that had family dinner every single night, and we never ate at the concession stand at the ball game, and we never got fast food, or we're never ordering pizza. I don't know those people. If you do, you great, I guess. But as a rhythm, you having a family dinner and figuring that out, whether you both like to cook or you both don't like to cook or whatever it is, that can do so much for a family 
There's so much data that tells us that families that do family dinner on a regular basis, and I'm not talking about here's your food, let's go sit in the living room and watch TV, or here's your plate, go up to your room, we're sitting at the table and we're all just playing on our phones, but just sitting there and having conversation for a few minutes as a family around a dinner table is massively important for, for a nuclear family. Second, avoid the dark side. So hospitality can have a dark side if it becomes cliquish or if you begin to exclude people purposefully. You saw this in Jesus' day, that there was a dark side of Samaritans aren't welcome and publicans aren't welcome and those that are really down and out, they're not welcome. We as a country or England as a country are not far removed from some moments of, of the dark side of hospitality, right? You think about the restaurant industry or the, or the hotel industry pre-civil rights and signs on restaurant doors that were no blacks allowed or signs on hotels in England of no Irish, no dogs, no blacks, that sort of stuff is so unfitting and so anti the gospel when it comes to hospitality, So you do not want to turn it into my 10 friends and I get together all the time and no one else is welcome and it just becomes this click. That is not the purpose at all. You're missing the point if you do it that way. Third, keep it simple. So there's a huge danger when you talk about hospitality, probably especially for the women in the room, that you feel this burden to be Joanna Gaines or Martha Stewart. And you don't have to be, okay? Can I release you from that burden, please? Keep it simple. You don't have to put chargers and fold your napkins into turkeys and have, you know, three forks and all this stuff. If you can do that and you love that and you get joy out of it, great. Go for it and invite me over. But if you, if you don't do that and you just want to, like, have peanut butter and jelly and popcorn, okay. You can keep it simple. I was reflecting on, on my wife and I, and we've done decent. We're not pros, but this is one of those practices we've done decent on. And honestly, I have her parents to thank for that because her parents were very good at this. But we wanted early in our marriage to establish a rhythm of being hospitable and welcoming people into our home. And so I can remember like when we first got our our little apartment and we had no uh, living room furniture, we had no dining room table, we had a a coffee table that was a hand-me-down that we got for free, and we had throw pillows. You know, like we were in the Easter somewhere, like eating on the floor. Um, But we still invited like some younger couples over at least once a month. And we would sit on our throw pillows on the floor around the coffee table that was way too small to eat a meal on for six of us. But we did, and we had a great time. And nobody complained, at least not to our face. But they they didn't complain. (laughs) I think of like when we first started pastoring here, we, we became the pastor, we bought a home very quickly. We wanted to communicate like we're planting roots, we're here, but we didn't have, a lot of it was empty, you know? We had a hand-me-down kitchen table at that point. We did go from coffee table to kitchen table from uh, the Wilsons, who are church members, they were in the first service, and they'd given us the table, but there was nothing in the living room. It was, just, it was empty. There was no, no, no decor on the wall. There was no whatever. But to us, that wasn't a barrier. We weren't going to not invite people over because the home wasn't as put together as maybe you would like it to be. Let's, let's still sit around the table and let's talk. And now we've filled it in and we've decorated and, and it's not that way anymore. But we've done that. Even now, we, we have a habit of trying to every two or three weeks host a few families after this service at our house. But that's, that's difficult when you're a pastor and a pastor's wife. Sunday mornings are busy. Like you are running and you are going and you don't, you know, my wife isn't staying home and skipping church and just in the kitchen all day. Like that's not what we're doing. So now it's, if you come over on Sunday and many of you have, it's very simple. It's the same meal every time and we don't make it. Jane S. Capri makes it. <laughs> every time. It is pizza and wedding soup because Jane S. Capri has the best wedding soup like in the world. And some breadsticks and some salad. And that's what, that's what we do. And it's, it's, not, it's not the best meal in the world. It's honestly not. But it works. And it's simple. And it works kind of for our schedule. So keep it simple. You don't have to overthink that. Fourth, and this is along the same line, compensate for your weaknesses. So if you love to clean and you love to decorate and you have space in your home, but you hate to cook. And you have a friend who loves to cook but they hate to clean and decorate and provide the space, team up. Go Batman and Robin on that thing and just do it together, you know? You, if you 
uh, perhaps don't really like to converse with people that much, you're a little more introverted, then get a friend who has the gift of gab and invite them over and, and compensate for whatever weakness that may be. If it's like, hey, we have three tiny little kids and they're going to demand our attention and then we're not going to be able to focus on our guests, get a teenager to come over and to watch the kids while you host or however you want to do it. The point is that you can compensate for those weaknesses and you can make it happen. We just had this, I figured out a new way this week to compensate for what may be a weakness of ours. So my wife was asking me, like, what are the, the top three or four things that you want for a Thanksgiving meal? Because we normally travel on Thanksgiving, and this year we're not, we're here. So the idea of like in our home hosting, we don't do it every year. She's like, remind me again, what are like the staples that, that you definitely want? So one of mine, ham for sure, I don't need a turkey. It's fine if it's there, but whatever. Ham, mashed potatoes and gravy, and then rolls with cinnamon butter. But, yeah, good idea, right? I heard those moans. My mom always made rolls, and she never made the cinnamon butter, but she would buy it from the store. So I told Maggie this, and she was such a blessing this week. She was going, she went to Aldi, she went to Walmart, wherever, and she told me, like, I can't come up with cinnamon butter. I said, I'm going to Butler on an errand on, I think it was Friday. I bet you Texas Roadhouse will sell me, like, <laughs> a bathtub of cinnamon butter if I ask them. Like, I'm going to try. So sure enough, you go in, this pro tip, people, six rolls and like a, a container of cinnamon butter from Texas Roadhouse, $2.50. I said, like, give me two, please. Like, $5, I'm out of here with cinnamon butter? Like, <coughs> did we have to make our own? No. Like, you can go buy some from the store. If you don't want to make a meal, order it in, you know, cater it, whatever, whatever it is. But there's ways to be hospitable that you can work around whatever perceived weakness you have. Six, invite some strangers. Excuse me, I'm on number four. I'm on number five. I'm going to pick one of these. I'm on a number, and here's what it says. <laughs> invite your circle of influence for a, for a meal. Say, who do I start with? Who do I invite over? Well, who do you work with? Who are your neighbors? Do you know them? Have you ever had a meal with them? Your small group at church. Hey, can we do small group at my house three weeks from now and we'll host and we'll provide a meal while we do it or something like that? Like there's, there's probably people right within your orbit that you can start with. But if you're bold enough or willing to, I would encourage you to eventually get to a point where you can invite some strangers for a meal because much of the hospitality in the Bible is aimed at strangers. It's aimed at people that I really don't know, but I want to get to know and I want to share, share the love of Jesus with them. So maybe there's people in your neighborhood. They're not your neighbors, but they're in your neighborhood and you don't know them. Invite them over for a meal. Maybe it's, it's another Christian. You sit in the same section every week, you get their name, then you forget it the next week, then you get their name again, and then you get it the next week, and then you've asked three times so you feel bad now and you still don't know their name. That person, right? Hey, you want to come over for lunch? I guarantee you have them over for lunch and talk with them. You'll remember their name after that. Maybe it's someone that you just met in small group. You've been there for two years and they're just coming in. Invite them over. Go get coffee with them. Whatever it is, there's ways to be hospitable with them. Seven, church in a restaurant. If you really don't want to do anything in your house and you really hate to cook, just this is, this is the hack. Hey, you want to go to church and go to a restaurant afterwards? Now there's only one rule. You have to pay, okay? <laughs> don't make them pay for your meal that you invited them to. That's, that's bad taste but, or bad form. So... Come to church. We'll get a meal afterwards. That's a way to do it. Eight, pr appreciate and participate in the corporate hospitality every Sunday. So I know some of you do not bemoan the fact that every Sunday someone gets up and they welcome guests and they say, there's this little card in your seat back, fill it out. And hey, there's a guest center over here and there's a gift box. Well, I've been here for 10 years. Where's the member center? Where, where's my gift box? I know some of you, I know how you think. Listen, what are we trying to do in those moments? We're trying to say, we are a family, you are a stranger who has stepped into our weekly family reunion, and we would like to welcome you. We would like to be hospitable to you. We would like for you to feel that, that you belong here. We would like to give you a gift. Those things, I know we don't give everyone a gift every week, it's just for the new people, but don't bemoan that, celebrate that, and be glad about that, because as as little as it is, it is our feeble attempt to try to be hospitable to people who are coming into our church for the first time. Lastly, perhaps you want to be hospitable by praying about foster care or adoption. 
What is that? Well, that it, foster care is indefinite hospitality to the nth degree. I have a roof for you. I have a bed for you. I have transportation for you. I have coaching for your parents or, or however I can help. I have food on a table for you. As long as you need it, we're here for you. That's foster care. What is adoption? It's not, it's not indefinite, it's permanent. I'm going to, to bring you in and welcome you and, and give you everything that I can possibly give to you because I love you. If that's not hospitality, I don't know what it is. So, uh, we've had many through the years and, and some right now that have fostered in our church. We've had many that have adopted. We in recent years have set up an adoption fund. If you're interested in adoption, please communicate with the office. We would love to help you and we would love to, to come alongside you and even provide some funding to, to make that happen. But pray about potentially foster care or adoption. There's many more I could give, but you're getting the point. The point is that Jesus had this habit and it was kind of rooted in, in Jewish tradition, but he had this habit that he really used in a pronounced way to welcome people at a table and to use a meal to reach and connect with others. And that habit is mandated to the church that they not forget it and that they take it up a notch. And I think we're good at this, but I would love to see us be great at this. I'll end with this verse, that little passage in Hebrews that talks about let brotherly love continue and don't forget to entertain the strangers. If you keep reading just a few verses later, you get to this part of Hebrews 13. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. All of those pieces of that verse are pieces that we talk about often, except the last phrase. That Jesus would give his own blood, he would die for us, to sanctify a people, to redeem a people, to call out a people. That he would suffer, that he would die on a cross to make this happen, but then it includes the phrase, without the gate. And the idea is, Jesus wasn't even welcome in the city. Like his suffering was one where he was so cast out that he was, he was completely put on the outside. His cross was a, you are not welcome here. And that is used as a leverage point to say, if Jesus would be willing to be unwelcomed, if Jesus would be willing to give of his blood, if Jesus would be willing to, to let go of his dignity and, and be shamed and mocked in that way. If Jesus could let go of all of that for us, then wouldn't we wanna make sure other people never feel excluded? Wouldn't we wanna make sure they never feel without the gate? Wouldn't we want to make sure they feel welcomed? And wouldn't we wanna make sure that they know about this Jesus who died for them? May that serve as a model, may that serve as an impetus to help us be a people that are hospitable.